All right. Well, <clears throat> welcome everyone to the third meeting of the DSL Rulemaking Advisory Committee for Division 89. Uh, appreciate all of the comments that we received at the last uh, meeting. Um, we are going to start in just a moment. We'll start today by addressing some of the comments that we weren't able to respond to fully at the last meeting. And then we'll move on to the next uh, sections of Division 89 rule that uh, were indicated on your agenda. Um, <clears throat> a couple just uh, meeting protocol things we go through. Uh, please keep yourself muted unless it's your turn to speak. Uh, RAC members, you can raise your virtual hand uh, when you wish to speak and we'll call on you in order. And um, interested parties, um, just note that uh, we, we, we do have time toward the uh, end of the agenda uh, for you to provide comments. Um, but uh, the, the majority of our discussion is for the members of the Rulemaking Advisory Committee. And with that, I think I'll hand it over to Kirk to get us started on our follow-up from meeting number two. You bet. Thanks, Steve. Hello, everyone. Good to see you today. Thank you for joining us in what otherwise should be your summer vacation. Now. Um, so let me start by, uh, I want to jump back to a couple of things from the last meeting. Um, so first of all, just as a reminder, on July 6th, you all got an email from uh, Danielle uh, that included a uh, uh, my, my sort of summary log of comments that I heard, uh, as well as uh, proposed changes uh, to the draft rule as a result of your comments. So uh, please look back to your July 6 uh, email for that. Um, at the last meeting, there were a couple comments, really more questions asked of DSL that uh, I did not have the answer to at the moment. Uh, but I do now, so I wanted to loop back to those. Um, one of them had to do, or was a uh, uh, something uh, brought up by Brian Cook from Clean Water Services, one of our RAC members, um, regarding uh, in-water work periods and ODFW's re recommended in-water work guidelines. Brian correctly noted that uh, the way that DSL interprets um, those guidelines is a little bit different than ODFW's. Uh, when ODFW talks about uh, in-water work guidelines and, and the dates for which it is better to work in the water, ODFW uses that to specifically mean work in the water, like in the wet. Now, when DSL conditions a permit, we require people to obey the in-water work guidelines for any areas below the ordinary high water elevation. So that's a little bit different because uh, it's certainly possible that there at any given time, there will be areas below ordinary high water elevation that are not wet. They might be wet come winter time when water levels rise, but um, at any given moment, they might be dry. And that, that is intentional, the way uh, DSL interprets that. And I describe that, uh, uh, the rationale for that in uh, our July 6 transmittal to you. Uh, Brian provided uh, some elaboration on that via email to me yesterday. So uh, I attempted to elaborate on my response email today for which you were all copied. So I won't go into kind of gory details on that. Please do take a look at the uh, email that I sent out to all of you today. Um, uh, and I think for now, I will just leave it with two things. Um, one is uh, if you still have questions, comments, or concerns about kind of what I'm saying in there, reach out to me directly and we can work through it. And if need be, we can bring it back to this table. And secondly, um, that 
it, if if we did want to try and address this discrepancy as uh, intentional as it is, um, we couldn't really do it as part of Division 89. We'd have to do it as part of the Division 85 rulemaking because that more holistically addresses the removal fill law. We're just looking at sort of a much narrower window of the general authorizations here today. Um, so that's kind of all those three and, and that for now. Um, the other question we got uh, that I now have a couple answers to that came, I think, from, yes, from uh, Lauren Poor uh, at the Farm Bureau. Uh, Lauren wanted us to confirm what the rollout schedule was for uh, the uh, ODA's uh, program um, for... Um, uh, let me get the term right, Ch uh, their uh, channel maintenance program that is cleaning out irrigation uh, uh, and drainage channels. Um, so it is a four-phase rollout. Uh, phase one was for Northwest Oregon and the Willamette Valley, and that happened uh, beginning uh, January of 2022. So the program is fully available to farmers in those regions. Uh, it rolled out to southwestern Oregon in January 2023, so it's now fully available to them uh, as of today. It will be available to central Oregon farmers beginning January 1, 2024, and then finally eastern Oregon, January 1, 2025. Uh, as a reminder, the significance of that is um, recall that DSL is proposing to do away with the general authorization that deals with removal of sediment behind tide gates. And one of the reasons we're proposing to do that, besides the fact that hardly anybody uses it, is that there are at least four different programs that folks can use to still get authorization for that activity. Um, the other question that Lauren asked is, do we know how many people have uh, applied to ODA so far? Uh, ODA's website uh, identifies, at least as of two weeks ago, eight validated notices to date from farmers in the Northwest and Valley area. Um, I suspect ODA is not seeing anything from Southwest Oregon quite yet, just because we're coming up now on the, the season that farmers would get out there and start cleaning out dry uh, uh, drainage channels. So I would expect to see that number grow this year. Um, so that that is it in terms of the additional research that I wanted to report back on. So before I move forward with sort of today's agenda, any questions? Seeing none, Kurt. Seeing none, okay. All right, very good. Then, uh, so um, for today and the next two meetings of the RAC, we're really going to sort of jump into the meat of the general authorization rules. So starting today, we are now finally going to start talking about the rules that authorize uh, very specific activities for this expedited permit process that DSL offers under general authorizations. So, so there are six activity types that we're going to be talking about. So for each of these three meetings, we'll tackle two. So for today's purposes, we're tackling uh, 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 minimal disturbance activities in essential salmonid habitat. And we're also tackling temporary impacts to wetlands and waterways. Uh, in preparation for this discussion, again, you got uh, uh, you got a markup of the draft rule on July 6 that included some commentary from me, some bubble comments uh, next to each change um, that discusses, at least in brief, why the department's proposing the change, and I'll elaborate on many of those today. Um, you also got, as an FYI, a link to our essential salmonid habitat map. So if you're not already familiar with sort of where the essential salmonid habitat streams are in Oregon, uh, you can just quickly click on that map and 
get a really nice picture of where all those streams are. There are a whole bunch of them in Western Oregon, especially on the coast range leading out to the ocean. Uh, as you move eastward, uh, they become less and less and less, except for Northeastern Oregon. And that's because, of course, essential semi habitat deals with salmonids. So ocean going fish would need to have access to those streams. So let's start. Um, oh, the other uh, thing I'll say is, so for the two rule sections that I'm going to go over today and for the next two meetings, keep in mind that they're all organized exactly the same way. They start with a purpose statement, very brief. Uh, the rule then talks about the eligibility requirements to qualify for the given GA. Uh, it then talks about what exactly are the authorized activities that are covered under this GA. And then finally, what are the activity specific conditions for this GA? Remember last month we talked about the general conditions that would apply to any project covered under any GA, sort of the big global ones. What we talk about today are the specific conditions for these specific activities of a given GA. So uh, we'll start with minimal disturbance within ESH. Uh, and I'll tell you right off the bat, kind of like four areas where we've made some changes. Um, right now, administrative rule uh, authorizes four activity types, four kinds of minimal disturbances that you're allowed to do under this GA. Uh, we've added one more for the proposed rule. So we are now proposing five, and I'll go over the fifth one. We're also proposing a pretty significant modification of one of the existing activities. So I'll spend a little time on that. Um, let's see. And we are, uh, we have modified, uh, right now, all of the activities are limited to being no more than four cubic yards for the project in the waterway. We're, uh, we've expanded that in a couple cases. We'll talk about that. So uh, let's look right at then uh, the purpose statement for minimal disturbance within ESH on the screen there. Um, just like last time, I'm only going to go through those rule changes that have some real significance, grammatical, structural stuff I wouldn't spend any time on. So right there in the purpose statement, you'll see that big addition that temporary impacts to wetlands or waterways associated with these activities, meaning these minimal disturbance activities, may be authorized by combining this general authorization with the temporary impacts GA. What that simply means is, as an example, uh, if you uh, need to do some investigative drilling under this GA, but you have to temporar temporarily cross a wetland to get there, meaning you have to temporarily impact it, you can also at the same time apply for the temporary impact GA, stack the two authorizations together to get a complete approval. That's all that sentence really means. So we'll uh, so we're going to stop at the end of each rule section and see what questions there are. So I'll stop there. Questions or comments from the RAC members? Just a reminder: um, if we don't get questions or comments, we assume that everyone is uh, okay with the proposed change. And not seeing any questions or comments, Kirk, we can move on to the next. Okie dokie. Um, so next section is the eligibility requirements. Uh, this is just uh, one sentence. So as I mentioned right now in rule, each of the four activities that's authorized by this rule, each one is limited to doing no more than four cubic yards of work. Um, given input from staff and from our Hatfield fellow who do an did an independent evaluation of our GAs back in 2017. Uh, it was recommended that we change the cubic yardage amount for a couple of the activities. So we can no longer have this blanket statement of four cubic yards. So instead, we just say that activities are limited to the five activities described, 
below. That's all. Pretty innocuous. But I will stop there and see if there are any questions. Doesn't look like we have any there, Kirk. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that one's kind of a no-brainer. All right, here's where we get into the meat of it. Now we talk about what are the uh, authorized activities. Um, so uh, there's a little typo there, first of all, let me call that out. Do you see that first sentence at the top? Authorized activities are limited to the following colon. Then there are a couple words after that. Uh, oops, those need to be deleted. So I don't know if you can do that in real time. Yes, you can, Danielle, that's awesome, thank you. There we go, now it makes more sense. Okay, so the first activity, it is an existing activity that we already authorized is investigative drilling and sampling, specifically for the purpose of designing structures and characterizing sediments toward uh, the design of structures. Um, currently, uh, rule allows for uh, up to four cubic yards of removal and fill per drill site and up to 10 cubic yards cumulatively. So if you're going to have multiple drill sites for one project, uh, you can do up to a, a cumulative total of 10 cubic yards. We're, we're proposing to simplify this one and just say no more than 10 cubic yards. Um, the, re the reason is we find that when it comes to these types of projects, trying to make a distinction between what's an individual drill site and what's it, what is the cumulative number of drill sites for an entire project kind of becomes a not very meaningful distinction for us in terms of how we're going to authorize the project or how we're going to view it for impacts. So we thought, let's just simplify this and just say, no more than 10 cubic yards, period. How you use to choose to spend that is up to you. Um, for those of you that don't deal with cubic yardage figures day in, day out, like DSL, let me give you a quick example so you know what this means. Um, how much is 10 cubic yards when it comes to drilling? So imagine if you say you had a drill borehole of six inches. That, uh, maybe a fairly common size, and you're gonna drill 50 feet down. Um, that turns out to be uh, about 0.3, about 0.4 cubic yards that is taken out and then put back in. Um, I'm sorry, it's 0.75, sorry about that. So what that means is under this rule, you could now do up to about 14 drill holes. That is drill the material out, put the material back in the hole that you're going. Just to give you some idea. So I, no, I'm gonna go ahead. I know that at last meeting, uh, Brad from ODOT brought up a comment or thought about this. So Brad, if you're out there, I think you are. Um, let's wait until I get through all five activities and we can come back to this one. Uh, second activity is scientific measurement devices. Um, the rule here shows that if there's a change. Actually, there is no proposed change. Uh, current rule says no more than four cubic yards per site, no more than 10 cumulatively. In this case, we're not proposing to achieve, uh, change anything. We find that generally this, this rule is working really well. It doesn't warrant a change in terms of uh, cubic yardage. Um, let's see, so I'll go to the third one. Well, ditto, uh, surveys. Uh, and this is surveys specifically for historical resources. Um, a lot of these sort of surveys are very, very small activities. We don't really often see uh, applications for volumes much more than this. In large, it's a, unless it's a full-on recovery operation of artifacts, in which case that would go through our individual permit process. We're talking about very sensitive projects in that case that warrant a much higher level of review. Um, the fourth one is probably uh, the biggest change, maybe. Um, so to understand this, uh, uh, I'll first point out that currently 
Uh, this rule allows for the maintenance of water intake and outfall structures only. Keep in mind that we do have an exemption in Division 85, so an exemption from any permitting requirements for maintenance of water control structures. What's a water control structure? Well, it's things like it's defined in Division 85. It's like culverts, dikes, dams, riprap, tie gates, drainage and irrigation ditches, structures that control the flow of water. You're already free to maintain those, uh, at least from DSL's perspective. So this rule kind of goes one step further and says, well, what about water intake and outfall structures? Um, so through the application of this rule over the last five years, our staff have find, found that we've concluded from their perspective, um, what seems to be happening is folks that have other forms of in-water structures that need maintenance are getting pushed into our long form individual permit process for what happens at the end of the day, we give them the same conditions as what they otherwise would have gotten out of this GA. That is what we're generally finding is it doesn't matter a whole bunch what the nature of the structure is. So why limit it? What's so special about water intake and outfall structures? So we are proposing to expand it to maintenance and reconstruction of in-water structures period. To give you an idea, the vast majority of projects that we see that would fall into this category, besides intakes and outfalls, uh, would be uh, retaining walls. Somebody has a retaining wall up on their property uh, that's uh, in the water. Invariably, some part of that retaining wall fails and they want to put it back, pick up those cinder blocks, put them back in place. Uh, no can do without an individual permit right now. The other thing that we see very common is, especially in highly urbanized environments, the foundations of buildings are often below the ordinary high water elevation. Literally, the wall, foundation wall of the building is the bank of the waterway. Folks can't touch those foundations without getting an individual permit right now. So our proposal is to put them through a more expedited process uh, if they're just doing maintenance and reconstruction. Um, before I leave this one, I will point out that the terms maintenance and reconstruction are defined terms uh, in administrative rule in Division 85. And I'm going to touch on those a, just a little bit later uh, in the day here. The last activity, brand new, uh, it actually came to us from uh, uh, a staff person and some targeted ODFW staff that are working on a uh, best practices guide for what are called beaver pond levelers and exclusion devices. Um, so if you're in front of your computer and you wanna see what a, a picture of just what I'm talking about, you can just Google beaver exclusion device and then click on images, and you'll get a hundred great pictures of exactly what I mean. It's really two things at the highest level. It is putting up a fence in front of a culvert, the inlet end of a culvert, to not let beaver build their dams right at the mouth of the culvert because that creates havoc. Uh, and the other thing it does is, is if there is an existing beaver dam and the water levels are getting to a level that's intolerable for humans, it would allow uh, folks to put in a leveling device, which is basically a standpipe that would set the elevation, the highest elevation at which the pond would be allowed to rise to before water starts draining into that standpipe. So the reason why we want to, one of the reasons we want to create a GA for this is that um, right now we want to create an incentive for folks to not tear out that beaver dam when it's starting to cause them a headache. 
um, if we can allow them to set that sort of standpipe and let the beaver dam stay in place, then let's do that and create sort of an incentive by giving them a quick permit pathway. Uh, tip, oh, yep. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt if you oh. have a thought to finish, but Nancy's got her hand raised. Oh, yeah. Hey, Nancy, go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. So um, I've been talking to our fish passage folks and the district staff, and this is actually a fairly complicated component, even though it sounds simple. Um, so I'll be bringing up some of the concerns in the next section regarding conditions. Okay. But regarding the cubic yards, uh -huh. um, the fish, fish passage and district staff feel that your proposal of four cubic yards of removal fill and 10 cubic yards combined is excessive and extreme when you're just putting in, you know, a fence or a standpipe, et cetera. Um, so, so they recommend that you reduce those um, to such as instead of four cubic yards, one cubic yard and three cubic yards cumulative. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll just note real quick on that proposal that um, up to one cubic yard is a freebie under the removal fill law in ESH. Okay. So okay. it would only be greater than one cubic yard. Um, well, let, let's, uh, anybody have any uh, immediate thoughts to that out there? Yeah, we'd like to hear from the group if you support this uh, proposed change or disagree. Lauren, Nancy, could you lower your hand, please? Um, uh, yes. So I just have a clarifying question on this one. Um, since I know we're going to have more people interested in things like this with the changes in the, the beaver rules. Um, after this legislative session, is this, would they have to go out? So say I have a agricultural property owner that has numerous areas where they have beaver activity. Would they have to get one of these for every single, would they have to get one of these permits for every single one of these they wanna do, especially if we lower the number of cubic yards? So would they need individual permits? Say they have multiple areas they wanna put in one of these. Yeah, right, right. So, um, always depends a little bit on the specifics. So, you know, at a global level, I think what I'd feel safe is saying is that most likely what they would do is probably submit a general, uh, a notification form to us for, for each one, for each activity. Um, you know, it's really, it's very much a cut and paste. If for some reason that would be like really excessive or really difficult for them to do because there are so many, then they should probably just talk to our ARC uh, resource coordinator and see what sort of bundling might make sense. Okay, thanks. Chris. Uh, right, thanks. Hello, everyone. I, I think I do have a little bit of a problem with the proposal from the department. And I think there are two things I'm thinking about at the moment. One is we might have beaver ponds, for example, that are fairly large. And I guess I'm not sure one cubic yard would necessarily meet the needs uh, in terms of this application. Um, the other thing, I guess I could be convinced otherwise if the department could, uh, ODF and W could maybe help me understand why the concern for four cubic yards is so much more significant than one cubic yard. I guess I'm not, I'm not tracking well enough to understand that their analysis on that difference. Thank you. My understanding in talking with, with Greg and others is that you're simply pushing a fence or pushing um, pipes in the ground. You don't actually have to fill to do this kind of activity. You don't have to remove material. You're basically pushing something. So there's actually no material, no soil that's actually being added or removed. You're putting a, a simple structure in. So that's why it doesn't add up very fast. So well, thank, thank you for that real quick. I, I guess I'm wondering when you put in a pond leveler, doesn't that leveler have to have an outlet? And I, I guess I'm, I'm imagining or envisioning that that outlet has to be buried somehow. Uh, the pipe, the full extent of the pipe, some part of it has to be underground, no? No, take a look. Uh, take, take a, a look, look at some more levelers. Yeah, take a look at those. <laughs> okay. there, there's no excavation in the creek. The, the leveling pipe goes through the beaver dam. 
um, obviously would have to do that. But otherwise, no, really the only, I mean, there's no volume associated with the fence. That's like nothing. Right. Uh, the stakes to hold the fence in place. Well, you know, you're talking about stakes that are that sort of diameter. You're never going to get to much cubic yardage with that. The only cubic yardage I really see are the anchors so that your uh, pipe doesn't float away. So it stays in place. And that's where you might run into a little bit of volume that, uh, yeah, you might, you know, one cubic yard, that might be difficult in some circumstances. So if I could, Kirk, just real quick, do you yeah. mean, for example, ballasting or anchoring those pipes, basically? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I might suggest, and I don't know if this would work for the department, uh, ODFNW, but would it be possible to, to go with the proposed language and kind of test drive this rule for several years. I mean, we know we're going to come back and review these rules every five years. I guess I might offer that we could, we could kind of test it with these current numbers. And if, if in fact, we find in the field and in reality, these numbers are way too high, significantly high, maybe we could adjust it at that point. Just a, just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Wondering if we have uh, thoughts from others on the, the proposed change. Nancy, did you have something you wanted to say? I, ju I just know that our fish passage folks felt these numbers were extreme. So keeping these numbers as is, I, I don't think would be considered acceptable. Do other folks on the rack uh, support the proposed change or, um, I mean, you can give a thumbs up if you support the change or if, if you're not commenting, um, you have to assume that you are kind of ambivalent. Lauren? Well, I guess my question and where I may be confused is since the not more than four cubic yards of removal fill is in connection with these devices, someone really wouldn't or couldn't be moving more than the necessary cubic yards. So I guess I, I'm not seeing, I'm a little bit confused about where the concern lies since it's not just a blanket, you can remove up to these this amount without it being connected to the devices. So they'll only be able to move or should only move what they need for these devices. What would be the other function of moving the material if not in connection with the devices? Yeah, if I think I understand correctly. So so the, these volumes are upper limits. There's no requirement that you fill and remove up to this. It's only what you really need to do your project. Would would it help if if we had if we set a little bit lower limit, but give DSL the discretion to go up to the full? And that would give us the opportunity to have a conversation with ODFW. That if somebody comes in higher than the limit, we could run over to ODFW and make sure that it's still okay. Does that mean sort of on a case by case basis in a sense? No, I think we create a, we'll pick a safe harbor cubic yardage. Always know mm -hmm. that you're good to go at X cubic yards. And then we'll have a statement that says, unless otherwise approved by DSL. Okay. And what that means is uh, if you come, come to us with a higher number, we're going to run over to ODFW and have a chat with them. And it may not, it'll be either a yes or a no. Okay, in light of that, I might suggest cutting these numbers in half then as the starting point. So by half, do you mean like two and five, Chris? Yes, sir. Correct. Okay. Nancy, okay. could you take that proposal back to um, your folks and see what they think? I think you can go with two and five. That'd be two fine. And five? Okay. Yeah. Does anyone, is anyone opposed to this uh, proposed change here that we, that we, I think we've landed on uh, with Nancy and, and Chris and Kirk here. I saw at least one thumbs up in support. But please let speak now if you are opposed to this, this change. Lauren, go ahead. I, I mean, I just I'll just say that whatever we could do to make it simpler is going to be more of an incentive for a landowner to do this. And so, um, the less hoops they got to jump through, the better, because um, they still have the ability to take an imminent threat or potential threat, depending on what kind of 
land they have or what they're growing. So we just want to make sure that if we want to incentivize these, we want to make sure that there's not too many hoops for landowners to go through to put them in. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Brian. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to support uh, Lauren's comment as well. Um, limiting the cubic yards um, may limit the application uh, um, or utility of the general authorization. And so um, it, it feels really important to understand the concerns of, of ODF and W and what adverse effects they see occurring um, associated with the increased cubic yardage um, at a and I'm assuming it's more associated with a single single location versus a cumulative, uh, the cumulative cubic yards, um, because I I would imagine there would be a desire to um, to sort of lump um, these together as much as possible um, if there are multiple um, beaver dams either in one system or across systems um, in order to increase the efficiency and the utility of of the general authorization. Lauren and Brian, are you, are you, I just want to understand, I, I understand the, you're saying that it's uh, the, the importance of this. I'm just wondering if you are um, saying you will not support uh, what's, what's been discussed or if you have some other proposal. I mean, it's not that I won't support it. I'm just wanting to put the concern out there that the more difficult it is or more hoops that are perceived that a landowner has to jump through, the less likely it is it'll be used. Fair enough. I was just flagging that. Yep, fair enough. Thank you for clarifying. Brian, same? Yeah, no, I, um, I, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, internal staff in Clean Water Services who work with these types of structures. And so I've, um, I, I did not receive any specific comments on the, um, four cubic yard, four and ten um, cubic yards, um, uh, and so I, I, I would like the opportunity to discuss um, the change with staff who who understand the construction techniques and the actual um, volumes that may be required for the specific uh, um, beaver dams in our district, um, uh, if, if possible. Okay, let's let's note that Danielle just that we might need to touch back on this at our next meeting. Uh, Timothy. Uh, yeah, since this is a, a new change like Brian was mentioning, uh, I would have to talk with other county folks to see what they think. I mean, my first sort of reaction to it is is if you're not impacting fist passage by these structures then and you're following all the other odfw's rules regarding screens on beaver devices then why do they care what the volume is uh i'm assuming that comment came from greg and i know greg quite well so i might reach out to him but i want to just go ahead and respectfully you know um say work the county's probably would be against this uh, until I talk to, to more folks about it. Nancy, did you want to comment there? I'm, I'm going to be providing a lot more information in the next section regarding fish passage and concerns about fish passage. And okay. Timothy will, um, uh, I guess, you know, revisit this next meeting so you have time to talk to folks um before you make a like a uh, firm opposition right. statement okay okay yeah i mean i think the first comment that was made is like well why would you be adding or removing volume anyway i think for the most part we would be in agreement now i've installed quite a few of the deterrent devices and you yeah like you know you're not adding a bunch of soil to put those in so i get it from that perspective I haven't done a lot of the pond levelers. I think Brian has more experience with that. So that would be another conversation. But uh, like I said, just because it's a sort of on the fly change, I'd, I'd want to talk with folks before we, before I would say, yeah, your name on it. Uh, it should be fine. Like I said, you really volume issues, just you're not, not like you're dumping a bunch of stuff in to create the, the, the device. Uh, that again, if you're, if passage is still achievable, then what? What's the comment? You know, I think DSL regulates removal fill, not ODFW. 
All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, we'll revisit this next time, Kirk, unless you have any final thoughts before we move on. Nope. Okay. Okay. Oh, um, Dave, Dave's got his hand yep. up. Sorry. Go ahead, Dave. I don't want to talk about beaver pond levelers. I want to talk about uh, sub four. Kirk, are you are you having trouble, or are, are I guess our property owners having trouble with the maintenance and reconstruction? And are they? It sounds like they're required right now to get an individual uh, removal fill permit. It, it, I, I appreciate if that's right. I appreciate this change. I'm just wondering if there if there are specific problems that are causing the department to recommend this. So yeah, so I'd say that the most typical example we see, Dave, is somebody that has. Uh, a perfectly legal uh, low retaining wall or call it a bulkhead along the bank of a waterway protecting their property. They have every right to have it there. A uh, high water event knocks out some portion of that thing. Right now under the removal of fill law, the only pathway available to them to pick up that material and put it back where it was is through an individual permit process. I yeah. think that is the classic. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, again, and I really appreciate that change. This is helpful. Thanks, Dave. All right, Kirk, let's move on to the next. Okay. Uh, I need to jump back now uh, to uh, Brad had a comment last time that we promised to pick up this time on uh, investigative drilling and sampling. Brad, if I understood correctly from the last meeting, you wanted to explore or talk about maybe a different way to do this one that considers stream size. Is that something you still want to put out there as a proposal? Uh, I don't, that's not, a, I don't feel strongly about it. I mean, if it, uh, you know, I, I noted that the, I think it was our Abernathy Bridge um, geotechnical investigation that was about 13 cubic yards. So uh -huh. that's a low, you know, that's on the Willamette. Um, so it just depends on where you guys want to put those thresholds. You know, obviously very different than doing that for a small stream, uh, but that's just it's just nuanced. Okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's a big project, and still from a cubic yard standpoint, fairly small. But yeah. Okay, then in that case, and if there are no other comments on authorized activities, I'm going to go ahead. All right, then we're gonna to go to the activity specific conditions. So again, these are the conditions that are in addition to the general ones that we talked about last time. Uh, projects eligible for this GA must adhere to the general conditions, yep, and the following activity specific ones. So that first condition is maintenance and reconstruction activities are conditioned as follows. And there's an A, a B, a C, and a D. Uh, I will comment that those are the exactly the same conditions uh, for the exemption for water control structures. All I did was lift them from Division 85 and use them here in Division 85, 89 under the assumption that what's good for the goose there is good for the gander here. So you have to meet the definition of what is maintenance and what is reconstruction. And those are in Division 85. If anybody uh, wants me to read those to you, I will. They're a little long, uh, but they're pretty much what you might think. Um, the structure has to have been serviceable, that is uh, used for the intended purpose within the last five years. And then finally, the maintenance or the reconstruction activity cannot significantly adversely affect wetlands or waterways to a greater extent than what was affected as a result of the original construction. So no new significant impacts because new significant impacts need mitigation. Uh, again, I'm gonna go through all of these and then I'll stop to take comments. Uh, the second condition has to do with scientific measurement. We've used the same language, but I added one sentence that's really targeted for uh, very short, short term scientific devices. A lot of times we see devices that are only put in the waterway for like a year or less. So we add that 
Where necessary, removal of devices may occur after expiration of a notification without further authorization requirement. So if you need to pull your device out, but you're already reaching, you've already reached the end of the uh, time period of your uh, GA, it's already expired, you can still go ahead and take out the device in the way that you described in your notice to us. Uh, surveys, uh, there's, that's just a change in grammar, nothing substantive there. Uh, Paragraph four, we're proposing to delete because we're now not just talking about maintenance of water intakes, we're talking about maintenance of a, any kind of existing structure. Uh, then for the new paragraph four, drilling and sampling, um, we added drill holes must be refilled in accordance with uh, OWRD requirements, uh, of course, when they're applicable just to make that connection uh, to OWRD. Uh, the next condition is five, maintenance and reconstruction of in-water structures. So uh, notwithstanding the definition of reconstruction, um, reconstruction does not need to be in kind. So let me just stop there for a minute. Right now, the definition in Division 85 says, if you're going to reconstruct something, you have to use the same materials, basically. Okay, well, what if we don't want them to use the same? I mean, what if what if the project owner says, I want to replace my concrete retaining wall with something that's more fish or habitat friendly? Well, right now, in administrative rule, we couldn't allow that without taking them through an individual permit. That seemed crazy to our staff. So we said that if somebody wants to reconstruct and use more habitat friendly, more native natural materials to the environment, we should be able to allow that. So that's what that paragraph attempts to do. And then finally, that last, uh, what is that, seven, I think, uh, the pond leveler and exclusion devices simply identifies these sorts of materials involved with those devices that could be used. So now I'll stop and take comments. Go ahead, Nancy. Okay, so I've spent quite a bit of time over the last day with Greg and a couple biologists, including the transportation biologist. And it's important for folks to recognize that this beaver pond levelers and exclusion devices both trigger fish passage and both result in fish passage issues. Um, and so there's a lot of language in our fish um, passage policy to try to address this. Um, I'm going to read you a couple sections out of first is OAR 635-412-0030-3C and then double I. And it basically says the beaver exclusion culvert protection devices shall allow for easy maintenance. Basically they have to be maintained or they result in fish passage issues. Um, be maintained, monitored and cleaned as necessary to provide fish passage. Have minimum clear space between vertical and horizontal members of six inches when only resident trout and lamprey species are present and be approved on a case by case okay. basis in areas with salmon, steelhead, bull trout, or other large bodied species. So, you know, pretty, pretty important element there. Um, the second is that pond levelers should not be designed to be permanent structures. They're expected to be short term treatments for a flooding problem where you have a beaver building a dam in an inopportune area. And if the problem is resolved or if the beaver is moved and abandons the structure, it's expected to be taken out. So it's expected to be a temporary structure. And abandonment in our rules are defined as surrender, decommission, no longer used for an authorized purpose or give up control. So one of the things that Greg is recommending is we add the word temporary 
Act activities may include temporary placement of water level and flow control devices. And then he's asking where the language, where you got the wording from wire fences, grates, guards, stakes, pipes, anchors. And he's recommending you just take all that out. Um, uh, that, uh, so I'll respond to that one, Nancy. So uh, I just got that list of materials from uh, uh, Rob Walton at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services example materials. That's all. It's just list yeah. intended to be examples. Right. He was just worried that a landowner will look at it and say, ah, oh, I can put any kind of grate or guard I want in the stream. Mm -hmm. You know, so he was thinking if if the goal was, you know, to address pond levelers and exclusion devices that you didn't have, need all of those ex examples. So, but one of the one of the elements that's going to be really important will be for the arcs to work with landowners to make them understand that these structures are supposed to be temporary um, and that the permitting through us are for temporary structures. And that he wanted to um, put out the offer to train on fish passage issues for the general authorization um, when you guys are ready for that. Thank you. Good. Nancy, I'm hearing two proposals. Correct me if I'm wrong. One to add the word temporary and Correct. the other to remove the example materials. Correct. All right, let's go to Lauren. So um, I'm just gonna flag that all of this, um, maybe we're putting the cart before the horse on this because with the passage of House Bill 3464, ODFW is gonna have to go and redo their rules uh, and adopt some rules that would consider ways to encourage coexistence with beavers and the use of tools to manage or prevent damage by beavers, including pond levelers and culvert protection systems. So I think that maybe we should I don't know if we should put a pause on it, but I would say all of these restrictions and things we're talking about right now are, would make it infinitely more difficult or discouraging for a landowner to work with either of these structures and then sort of defeats the purpose of uh, 3464. <laughs> so I'm struggling here with uh, what the policy that we want to promote here is do we want to promote coexistence with beavers and the use of these structures or do we want to make them really difficult and um confusing uh for those right. landowners who want to use those structures um so i think i just wanted to raise that issue that there will i anticipate there should be some changes that address these issues for landowners um, to encourage the use of the structures, because right now it doesn't seem that the use of those structures are consistent with, consistent with fish passage rules um, in a way that would be actually useful to landowners. Yeah. Lauren, I, I hear you. I just want to share that I think the important thing is to recognize that these the way these some of these are built are not expected to be long-term structures and that it's key that the landowner is maintaining the structure or taking it out if it's no, never, no longer necessary, if the beavers moved on or the structure's partially blown out. Um, so I don't, think it's, I don't think it's in direct conflict with trying to conserve beavers. I just think it's more complicated than it shows on paper here with, you can just insert a structure because there is fish passage issues and there is, you know, a changing landscape out there. Yeah, I guess my comment isn't about the policy of wanting to conserve beavers. It's the policy of wanting to incentivize landowners to take that step to do that because mm -hmm. it does still allow for the take, 3464 still does allow for the take of beavers, mm -hmm. um, but they want to incentivize landowners not to. And as I said before, the more hoops we jump through, the more complicated we make it, the more um, costs that are added to it, to that individual landowner that they have to take on in order to do this, the less likely it is that they're gonna choose to do this. And so we want to make sure that we're making it 
um, something that is achievable for your average landowner, not something that becomes um, time consuming or way too costly for them to do because they won't do it if it is. Right. So, so let, let me jump in here with something that might help Lauren. So uh, I think you're absolutely right in that sort of, you know, we're kind of on the cutting edge, if you will, of this technology and how it's going to be looked at from a regulatory perspective. And I understand the idea of, well, maybe we're getting the cart before the horse. But here's my concern. If we don't create something now in the GAs that can allow these sorts of activities in a streamlined sort of way, then that means for like, realistically speaking, the next five years, everybody that wants to do this is gonna to have to go through an individual permit. Talk about complicated, talk about expensive. Um, my feeling is let's get a GA in place so that for the folks that can meet the couple conditions of this, we've got that good, quicker review uh, home for them rather than pushing them all to an individual permit. Brian, go ahead. I um, just wanted to first express that I was very happy to see um, Beaver Pond Levelers and ex Exclusion Devices um, integrated into the general authorization um, uh, uh, in order to, to help facilitate um, use of these devices um, where conflicts occur um, in our in our district and our watershed, the Twalton watershed. Um, we have a we have a lot of of interactions with beavers, increasingly so, uh, and um, and utilize want to utilize uh, these devices to um, both protect uh, private property. Um, and um, and also uh, protect the functions and values of, of waterways um, within within the watershed. I I want to ra raise uh, concern around the use of the term temporary and direct uh, that concern towards uh, some of the uh, definitions utilized by the Department of State Lands uh, in um, OAR 141, 085, 05, 110. Um, Definition 99 for temporary impacts, uh, which uh, limit temporary impacts to uh, a duration of 24 months. And so um, in order to be consistent with other regulations, I'm concerned about the use of the term uh, temporary in, in meeting the objectives um, for these, the pond levelers, levelers and exclusion devices. And so um, I think there's, uh, more understanding needed about the duration and, and that ODF and W is expecting these uh, structures to be uh, to be placed and um, and trying to find uh, opportunities to support streamlining the permitting process and also meeting the uh, department's needs. Thanks, Brian. Chris. Yeah, just real quick, I just want to say I appreciate Nancy's concerns expressed, and I do think there's some complexities around beaver ponds, no doubt about it. I guess I wonder, would it make sense to to break out beaver pond levelers and exclusion devices into two separate lines? I do think they're different, and I think if I understand Nancy's comments, most of the concerns from Greg Apke at the Fish Passage uh, program are around exclusion devices and probably not pond levelers. Um, that's not exactly true. Both of okay. them. I apologize. Both of, yeah, that's okay. It's, it's, this is super complicated. That's why I ended up talking with three of our biologists. Um, both of them cause fish passage concerns. The pond levelers are more of the ones that we would be expected to be taken out um, when and if the beaver leaves or when and if the issue is resolved. Exclusion devices will always will likely be needed long term if if you still have an undersized culvert there um, that's attracting the beaver to it. Um, they both require maintenance. Um, yeah, 
And there might be a way of addressing the word temporary up above where you in number two with a scientific measurement here it says where necessary removal of devices may occur. We could have language like that too, or at least it could be a component that the ARC folks are talking about where necessary you know, if the beaver has moved or if the condition is self-resolved, these structures would be moved um, or removed. Yeah, yeah, if folks wanna, yeah, uh, leave the, yeah, that sort of finer wordsmithing, I'd be happy to, to take care of that and have you guys look at the next draft. Brian's right, we can't use the word temporary because of that definition, another rule, but there are more ways to skin that. Don't worry about that. Timothy? Yeah, I think, it kind of got addressed in that last stuff that Kirk had to say that we, the counties would also take issue with the, the use of the word temporary and not specific to DSL stuff, but you know, ODFW's new rules and their exact wording for beaver exclusion devices don't mention temporary themselves. So that seems like them trying to rig, change their rules through DSL's rules. If, if ODFW wants te to define what temporary is and that these structures should be maintained, then they should put those in their own rules. It does okay. say they need to be maintained in here. Maintained, but removed, pardon me, or that they're only temporary. The beaver exclusion culvert protection devices shall, one through four, none of that says anything about them being assumed to be temporary. Okay, well, I hope you get a chance to, to chat with Greg because he was stating that the assumption was these weren't expected to be long-term structures and they're not built to be long-term structures. Absolutely, yeah. And I think in the case of the counties, the ultimate goal is to replace those culverts and achieve fish passage um, if, if it's an undersized culvert. I know Washington County um, did a lot of that. We have a programmatic, or they had a programmatic agreement or have, sorry, I'm not with them anymore. So the language gets a little confusing. Uh, to, to replace those structures, but I know a lot of other counties have far less funding and far less motivation to do it. And I think any limitations you make on these GA rules are just gonna result in people not following any of the rules. Lauren? Um, is there a way as you're wordsmithing it to connect it back to any new rules developed by ODFW related to beaver coexistence devices that are adopted after this GA comes out um, mm. just to make it consistent with ODFW rules as they change? I can't see Danielle's face at the moment, but she might be wincing. <laughs> uh, you're, you are absolutely correct. Sorry. No, so I'm not I, wincing, just, just um, it, it's hard. We, we want to make sure because they've not gone through the rulemaking process, like we can't, you know, put it in there and it would kind of almost retroactively do something. And it's really advised to stay away from citing other rules for agent or other agency rules um, within because of the changes that could occur. Um, and then those changes not meshing. Uh, with the rule language as as it is, and if we um, and it wouldn't be an easy correction to go back and make if we needed to revise how those interact. Thank you. Yeah. That makes. Yeah. I was going to say that makes sense, but um, I think that in that case we should try to make this um, as open as possible so that it would allow for those changes um, that may come out mm -hmm. to encourage the mm -hmm. use of these. Yep. Or that would be my uh, recommendation if you want mem like my members to use it. Kirk, did I did I hear from you that you'd like to like not <clears throat> not um, go through a full um, rack um, back and forth on this, but rather uh, go back and try to make some modifications and come back at the yeah. meeting with some mo modified language? Is that correct? yeah? Thanks, Steve. I, I've been penciling out here. It's it's not ready to, I'm not ready to talk about it, but I've got a pretty simple word change that I kind of think will get this issue resolved. Okay, then uh, I want to play with it a bit more. We'll revisit at, at our next meeting. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone for your comments. Really helpful discussion. Uh, on to the next.
Uh, then I think that takes us to the next GA that we're going to discuss, uh, which is temporary impacts beginning on uh, 089, 0700. Um, so at the highest level, uh, we're proposing uh, uh, three, three fundamental changes. One is we're proposing to expand the kinds of waters that could be included for temporary impacts. Uh, in one case, we're proposing to expand the size of the temporary impact that would be allowed. And the third thing uh, we're proposing to do is make uh, the rectification report, that is the report that has you show us that you, that you took out and restored the site back to what it was. And we've just made that a little bit more robust. So we'll go over each of those. So right there in the purpose statement, you can see already uh, two big proposed changes. Uh, as it stands today, rule limits uh, temporary impacts to non-tidal wetlands. That is wetlands that are not in any way influenced by the ebb and flow of tide. Um, we are proposing uh, to um, expand that to include tidal wetlands. That proposal comes from me uh, as a former manager at DSL. I was often frustrated by our staff taking applicants through our longest form permit process for small temporary impacts to tidal wetlands with a permit that has exactly the same conditions that they would have gotten as a general authorization. Um, so uh, we are proposing to include um, tidal wetlands with some further uh, limitations that I'll get to in just a bit. The other thing we're proposing to do is including an allowance to temporarily impact waterways for just two very specific activities that will come up again in the next section. So I think what I'll do is I'm gonna continue on to the next section because it's so integral to understanding this whole thing. So if we don't mind, we'll go straight to 705. Uh, so to be eligible, project must adhere to, and there's just a couple things here really, um, and it's only the smallest of changes. Um, uh, so we're saying, uh, hopefully in a more clear way now that activities can't convert forested or shrub wetlands, which tend to be much more sensitive wetland types, to a different kind of wetland. And you can't convert them to open water or to a pond. So if you temporarily fill the wetland, you can't remove the fill and make it a pond, for example. That wouldn't count. Uh, and the other thing we're saying is that um, if you're uh, if you have a temporary impact to a wetland, you do have to do a delineation report. That has always been the case. We're just making it clear here that it's only for wetlands. If you're having a temporary impact to a waterway, you don't need to do a delineation report. I'm going to continue on to the next section again, just sort of to round out your understanding of what we're proposing here. So this is the uh, authorized activities. <laughs> um, so it's temporary impact to half an acre or less of non-tidal wetland. Right now in rule, it's limited to 0.2 acres. Uh, so we are proposing an allowance to increase that impact to 0.5 acres, but it comes with a caveat uh, in terms of how long you're allowed to keep that uh, impact in place. Kirk, yep. pause there. I know you got okay. a flow, but uh, okay. that's a lot of info. Brian's got his Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to, um, um, raise a, um, uh, a, a concern about the reference to, um, you know what, I'm gonna have to come back because my brain just, just completely froze up. I'm dealing with a bad headache and I apologize. No problem, Brian. We'll, no worries, we'll keep no going and let yeah. us know when you're ready. Go ahead, Kirk. All right. 
So again, temporary impact for non-tidal wetlands increased to 0.5 acres as a recommendation from our staff and from our Hatfield fellow. You can see in my bubble comment there that um, um, why that's the case. For uh, tidal wetlands, generally a more sensitive, obviously a more dynamic environment. Uh, we kind of want to proceed with some caution here. So we are proposing to limit temporary impacts, in that case, to 0.2 acres, just so that we can get a feel uh, for this and confirm that we're not running into impacts that are more than minimal, because that would violate the intent of uh, general authorizations. The third activity now is for waterways. This would be new. It would be the placement and removal of structures uh, to isolate a work area from the waterway and conduct fish salvage, not to exceed 100 lineal feet, measured as the longest length of the isolated work area. This activity, work area isolation, far and away the biggest temporary impact we see uh, to waterways. Uh, it is one of the big reasons why projects get kicked out of general authorizations uh, is because they do have to do some small amount of dewatering. And the minute they have to do that, they don't qualify for any GA. Uh, so we're trying to find some way to uh, allow smaller levels. We picked 100 uh, lineal feet uh, using a, uh, we did a uh, query of all our permits that uh, we had issued over, can't remember if it's last five or 10 years, to see what sizes of uh, work area isolations we tend, tend, to, tend to authorize. And they tend to either be really big or really small. Uh, we wanna keep them pretty small here, so. From our review, it looked like about 100, cube, 100 lineal feet is sort of the biggest of the small isolation projects that DSL has experience with. Uh, the other temporary impact waterways would allow is temporary placement of spud piles. Don't think that spud means potato here. Uh, during construction activity. Spud pile is just basically a, a pile that's on each of four corners of a barge, and they drop those piles onto the uh, bed of the waterway to anchor that barge in place for the time needed for it to do whatever maintenance or work activity it's doing while it's out there on the waterway. As soon as the barge is done, it pulls those piles back up and goes on its way. I will stop there now. Great, Nancy. Um, just quickly, is it possible for us to have consistent language mm. in other sections? You talk about fish and wildlife salvage. You talk about aquatic fish and wildlife. It just would be great to have the consistent language throughout this section too. Okay, fish and wildlife salvage would be the correct phrasing, Nancy? Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. Thank you. All right, are there other questions or comments about the sections that uh, Kirk just walked us through? Okay, not seeing any Kirk. All right, so let's then talk about uh, some of the specific conditions that we put on these uh, activities. Uh, so uh, number one is uh, temporary waterway structures for work area isolation would need to be placed to, and you'll see a listing of A, B, C, D, and E there. Just so you know, where did, where did I get that language? I stole it straight from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and I think it was one of their nationwide permits for a similar activity. I read their conditions and how they did it, and it seemed like it makes sense to have it consistent with them. So, um, Kirk, your Brian's, Brian's oh, got a question. Yep. Go ahead, Brian. Well, yeah. Yep. Thanks. I, I'm not, I wasn't sure if you were going to move on or if you were going to go through each one, um, but uh, I just wanted to raise uh, some concerns about the not be cha channel spanning um, uh, condition. Um, 
my, my recommendation is to add in uh, or, or to have it be not be channel spanning unless approved by the department. Um, many of the headwater tributaries are very small and uh, and would would be very difficult to not be channel spanning um, to provide um, bypass. So um, yeah, just want to want to encourage the the flexibility. Uh, giving flexibility to the district uh, and discretion for the resource coordinator. Does anyone oppose the change proposed by Brian or Kirk? Do you have any comments on it? Well, well my, my comment is the department always loves to have discretion. <laughs> it's also nice to give people predictability too. So does anyone oppose uh, the, the proposal that Brian just made? All right, um, Kirk, just so, so we all know, I know there's a lot of changes here. Do you prefer to take questions as we go through? Yeah, it's okay. These? Yeah, we're pretty close, getting close to the end anyway. So it's okay. As questions come up, I'll take them. Perfect, okay. Um, so Brian already uh, caught 1B there, not be channel spanning, and we've got a proposal. 1C, not be eroded by expected high flows for the duration of the project. I think that's an obvious one. And not dewater any wetlands. And finally, provide for temporary water management and fish and wildlife salvage. Is that the right term? Yes. Uh, prior to commencement of in water work. And there is below that uh, the language Nancy had given us before about an Oregon rescue salvage permit from ODFW is required to conduct fish and wildlife salvage. Uh, so, and it gives the uh, state and federal citations for that. Uh, the rule then uh, has under number two there, specific for those spud piles, temporary placement of spud piles for barge anchoring may only occur where the barge will not be grounded on the bed or the banks of the waterway at any time. That is a condition straight from our individual permits. We don't want uh, barges uh, sitting on the, the bank of a, uh, 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 the bed of a, a stream or an estuary uh, impacting habitat, mussel beds, clam beds, eelgrass, all would be adversely affected by uh, barges bottoming out. We want to avoid that. We've got a few questions or okay. comments here. Yep. Kirk, I'll start. Brian, go ahead. Uh, just, uh, I, um, I, I would like opportunity to um, to provide a more substantive comment on the not to dewater any wetlands. I, I have some concerns uh, about uh, wetlands below ordinary high that actually are are dewatered associated with um, the in water in water isolation area and so I might uh, maybe a solution is to also include unless approved by the department uh, to this condition as well um, in order to allow a resource coordinator to approve um, dewatering where where the effects are are minimal Kirk, how would you like to handle that basically Brian's requesting that we revisit this next time um, uh, well I think I've heard him offer a specific proposal okay so, uh, just adding to the end of that statement unless otherwise approved by the department okay I mean there are certainly circ circumstances where we do have small bench wetlands below ordinary high that will get caught up in an isolation area so uh, they will be dried out for some period of time but certainly uh, hydrology restored when the dewatering is removed. Okay, if that's the proposal then similar to the previous one, are there any, is there any opposition to that uh, addition unless approved by the department? Okay, not seeing any. Okay. Uh, we are down to uh, four and what should be five if we get that fixed. Uh, those two green paragraphs. The, those are two conditions that are already in administrative rule. Right now they're up in the general section. 
I just plucked them out of there and moved them into temporary impacts GA because they're all about temporary impacts. So it's just relocated text from another part of rule. There's no real substantive change there. It's not an addition. I think, Kirk, those are correct as three and four. Three and four, thank you. Okay, yep, you're right, three and four, thanks. It's a little muddled. Yep, yeah, for sure. Uh, next change is, ah, yes. Temporary, uh, timing of temporary wetland impact rectification. So notwithstanding the definition of temporary impacts, which we've already discussed now, which normally would mean two up to two years, um, reestablishment of pre-construction contours and planting to revegetate temporarily, temporarily disturbed areas must be completed within 12 months of initial impacts or before expiration of, uh, of the GA, whichever comes first, unless otherwise approved by the department. Uh, and you see there our rationale for that. Um, one big reason is that we have uh, plenty of uh, wetland species that have a lifespan of uh, significantly less than two years. And when we allow fill for two years, we are extirpating that species from that habitat. Uh, and that's, that's a problem, uh, knowing that GAs can only have minimal adverse effects, no long-term harm to water resources. Uh, it also goes hand in hand with um, uh, our staff recommended this language if we were to expand the allowed impact from point two from point two acres to point five acres. We would want to see the duration of that impact shortened. Uh, for for waterways, what we're saying in the next paragraph is, whenever you're done with the isolation, you remove it. Period. Any questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. All right. Uh, the final part of this rule is regarding the rectification report. Um, a rectification report was always required. We've just added a few things to it. Uh, unless otherwise directed by the department, a rectification report demonstrating restoration of pre-disturbance grade and revegetation must be provided to DSL within 90 days of temporary impacts rectification. Um, so I'm gonna point something out uh, maybe for uh, the Watershed Council folks right away. Uh, our staff really wanted to see that unless otherwise directed by the department. The staff felt that in some cases, especially for temporary impacts associated with habitat restoration projects, a full, uh, a uh, full rectification report may not be warranted. Um, so you can talk to your ARC about that on a case-by-case -case basis for those more voluntary habitat projects to see if that report's really gonna need to be required. So that report has a cover sheet with basic information, uh, a description of any deviation in the size or location from what you told us in the notification. Any deviations have to be accompanied by scale drawing that shows wh where you deviated, because we do keep uh, uh, we do keep uh, shape files of uh, all of our authorized impacts, so we need to know if they changed. Uh, uh, is there any deviation in the restoration to uh, pre-constructed uh, grades or vegetation from which told us? And finally, for temporary wetland impacts, uh, it's always been the case and it still would be the case. You need to send us at least one data plot proving that uh, the site still meets the three criteria for a wetland. And then of course, some photographs never hurt. Questions or concerns on the uh, rectification plan? Not seeing any. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and that is pretty much all the sections we intended to go through today, correct, Kirk? Yeah, yeah, it sure is. And uh, wow, I 
I've got some good stuff here to chew on uh, for you guys. I may need to reach out uh, to a couple of you as I sort of um, uh, work this, massage this language a bit, just to make sure I'm fully covering the bases here. And uh, pretty quick, we're gonna turn around and show you a redraft of what we came up with. Um, let, uh, if I could, Steve, I wanna ask the folks a question. Please. So this last time we gave you at the end of, as a result of meeting two, we gave you a new draft of the rule that showed the changes that we made as a result of the meeting. And I gave you a separate summary of the changes okay. as sort of a summary log. Was it helpful to have both, to see it done both ways? Or is it good enough just to get the revised draft rule? Any thoughts or preferences? Yeah, go ahead and just unmute and or give us, give, if, if, uh... If you liked the additional um, document, the log, you know, give a thumbs up or go ahead and unmute and let us and know. Just, sorry, just for clarification, the log Kirk is referring to is at the end of the summary that was sent out. Yeah. Maybe maybe people didn't see it. It looks, oh, that doesn't help. Yeah, that so doesn't it, work. It's a table that has three columns. The affected rule section, a summary of what the RAC's comment was and what DSL's response is. That is, what change are we making to rule? If we're not making a change, why not? I can't imagine anyone would be opposed, Kirk, unless uh, it's a it's an onerous task for you. Um, I, I'm sure people find it helpful. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Well, uh, I get paid by the hour, so hey, man, it's all. <laughs> All right. Well, it seems like uh, the, the the primary um, item was around the the temporary language, temporary yep. impact, um, th the the beaver uh, the beaver uh, structure and the and the levelers. So yeah. Um, and then we added in a few instances. Oh, also the the amount of uh, fill, which you were gonna, which folks were gonna get some more uh, information on and. Uh, for those who are going to talk to your constituents, feel free to send us an email in advance of the next meeting rather than waiting until the next meeting to share that information. Like I said, Kirk might reach out to you, but um, we'd rather get the information before the next meeting so we can come in with uh, proposals um, that uh, the folks in, in question have considered. Uh, if there's no other questions or concerns at this time, I'd uh, like to open the floor up to our interested parties to see if uh, anyone has any questions or comments on any of the uh, issues we've covered today or any of the, the discussions that you've heard. So any interested parties have comments. All right, I am not seeing any. Um, Danielle, anything else that we need to cover today? I think we worked through our agenda. Anything else on your list? Um, no, I think it's all been addressed. Um, a lot of the things that um, we wanted to revisit last meeting, Kirk made those edits and put them into this draft and, and put them in the comments log. Great. Kirk, any final thoughts or comments for the, for the rack? Uh, nope, just look forward to chatting with you next month on the stream bank stabilization general authorization. Uh, note for Dave Honeycutt, that's always an important one to your constituents. Uh, and the other one we're doing is, uh, darn it. Uh, oh, uh, overwater structures. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Another great discussion, really productive, really helpful. Um, again, please don't hesitate to reach out if you get some more information on your thoughts and comments and we'll see you at our next meeting, which is scheduled for, Danielle, do you remember? <laughs> it's on the calendar right next to me, August 17th. August 17th. We'll see you then everybody. Thank you.